Many different innovations and discoveries have converged to make dental implants possible. Today, we take a closer look at a few of these historic events. Oh, hey, Tony. I'm just getting started practicing our dental implants. How about you? Oh, well, me too. That's what I'm working on next. Well, oh, good great. Luck. Thanks. Good luck to you. So what is a dental implant? Let's find out from an expert, like our own professor, Dr. Fleischer, in oral surgery. I'm an oral and maxillofacial surgeon. I'm a uh, clinical associate professor at New York University College of Dentistry. So, um, started just starting off with the dental implant, which is an artificial titanium fixture, uh, which is placed surgically into the jawbone uh, to substitute for the missing tooth and its roots. Uh, we now know that the oldest dental implants date back over a thousand years to the Mayans. The earliest known functional dental implants were discovered in Honduras in 1931, in a mandible dated to 600 AD from the Mayan civilization. These implants consisted of shells that were first sculpted into teeth, then inserted into slots cut into the alveolar bone. The bone showed signs of healing and binding to the implanted shell, indicating that the implant was used during the individual's lifetime. Additionally, Remains from the Mayan civilization show widespread tooth enhancement, likewise dating back to about 600 AD. Inlays of jewels such as jade were often placed into the incisors by drilling a hole and cementing the stone in place. These inlays served a cosmetic purpose, not unlike this modern cosmetic crown created by Professor Hirata. Examples of primitive dental prosthetics have even been discovered from ancient Egypt, composed of a bridge of human teeth attached to the surrounding teeth by gold ligatures. But current research suggests that these bridges could not have been functional, and would only have been placed post-mortem to restore the body for the afterlife. In the late 17th century, a middle-aged Dutch draper named Antoine van Leeuwenhoek began experimenting with glass. He soon invented a method for polishing tiny glass spheres. Mounting them and peering through them, he found that these spherical lenses magnified his vision. In fact, they provided such an improvement in resolution over any other previous lens that his invention is seen as the first microscope. Through these microscopes, he was able to visualize not only fine details on ordinary objects, but even unknown tiny life forms in droplets of rainwater. We now know that what he saw were single-celled organisms. 
while his microscopic observations of known life, such as mold and insects, earned the respect of the Royal Society, Leeuwenhoek's account of single-celled life was met with doubt and ridicule. It took live demonstrations to Royal Society nominees to convince them that these animalcules existed. Leeuwenhoek himself never published a single scientific article, but fortunately, he wrote nearly 200 letters to the Royal Society, and the Royal Society did publish their correspondence. After Leeuwenhoek's discovery of microbes, as well as later advances in microbiology by Louis Pasteur, it would only be a matter of time before someone would apply this new understanding to make healthcare safer. Surgery as we know it did not exist until fairly recently. In the mid-1800s, patient survival rates remained less than 50%. This was largely due to sterility, or the lack thereof. Major operations at the time were performed while wearing street clothes, including a heavy woolen frock coat that was infrequently, if ever, washed. Surgeons believed that their cleanliness was perfectly adequate. Thus, hand washing with soap and water was not required. In fact, the prevailing explanation for the infections their patients suffered was foul air. This miasma theory had persisted since the second century, when it was promoted by the influential physician Galen. However, a British surgeon named Joseph Lister, inspired by Louis Pasteur's experiments and the burgeoning germ theory of disease, began his search for an antimicrobial to lower the rate of post-operative infections. Lister noticed that carbolic acid was used to treat sewage, and then this sewage was used to irrigate fields. The carbolic acid did reduce the smell, but it did not harm the livestock that grazed there. So in 1867, he developed a device for spraying the carbolic acid onto surgical fields, thereby sterilizing the area. Additionally, he insisted on spraying all instruments and dressings with the carbolic acid solution. Despite his success, antiseptic technologies were not widely adopted for another quarter century. But with time, the medical community recognized the importance of his contributions. Lister went on to become president of the Royal Society, and he even had a popular product named in his honor. In 1895, German mechanical engineer Wilhelm Röntgen was experimenting with cathode ray tubes. He systematically passed electricity through the vacuum tubes and recorded the fluorescence that they induced. To his amazement, even when he blocked all visible light with black cardboard, the cathode rays were able to pass through and make a fluorescent sheet glow three meters away. He assigned the mysterious new radiation a temporary name, X-rays, for the common mathematical placeholder X, indicating an unknown. After two more weeks of meticulous work to confirm his strange finding, Runchin took the first radiographic picture ever of his wife's hand. Upon seeing her x-ray, she exclaimed, Ich habe meine Tod gesehen. Only a few weeks later, Runchin published his results. The medical community immediately grasped the power of the x-ray for visualizing the interior of the body and the X-ray began to be adopted with a month of the paper's release. Runchen's work secured his place in history as the inventor of diagnostic radiology. For his discovery, he was awarded the first Nobel Prize in physics. Runchen wanted all of humanity to benefit freely from his discovery, so he decided not to secure any patents. Unfortunately, this decision, compounded by post-World War I inflation in Germany, left Röntgen to die bankrupt in 1923 of intestinal carcinoma. In 1668, a Dutch surgeon named Job van Meekeren reported the first documented graft of tissue from another species, or xenograft. We've successfully crafted this dog's bone into that soldier's head. I'm a genius. Bone from a dog's skull was successfully used to repair a soldier's head wound. However, the church deemed the treatment to be unchristian 
and the soldier was excommunicated. The patient returned, asking for the graft to be removed. Doctor, you've made me a monster. The church says I'm not allowed back in unless you take this dog out of me. What? I saved your life. You're not a monster. Please, doctor, I beg of you. Very well. Nurse, my scalpel. To the surgeon's amazement, when the scar was reopened, the graft had integrated so completely that it could not be distinguished from the surrounding bone. Did you think I'd forgotten you? Perhaps you hoped I had. In 1952, Swedish orthopedic surgeon Per Ingvar Bronemark was studying blood flow. In order to view the bone, he had placed optical titanium chambers into the shins of rabbits. But when he went to retrieve them, Bronemark found that the optical chambers were impossible to unscrew. The bone had adhered itself to the titanium surface. Bronemark termed this discovery osseointegration. Bronemark was able to extend his work to large dogs, where he successfully repaired defects of the mandible and tibia using titanium fixtures. Shortly after Reader's Digest had published a piece discussing Bronemark's research, he was giving a presentation on osseointegration. A well-known academic in the audience rose to chime in. This may prove to be a popular article, but I simply do not trust people who publish themselves in Reader's Digest. And I don't trust people who advertise themselves on the back of boxes of toothpicks. Bronemark's first patient had been born with severe deformities of the face and jaw. Now in middle age, he did not have any teeth either. Bronemark suggested using titanium fixtures to rebuild his lower jaw. Four fixtures were implanted, and they also integrated just as Bronemark had expected. For the first time in his life, he could eat and talk normally. His implants remained in place for the next 44 years until the end of his life. By 1965, Bronemark's titanium fixtures were ready for use in human patients. But where did titanium come from? Implants and prosthetics of many different materials have been attempted. From shell, to animal bone, to steel, to wood, and even human teeth, there's been a long line of experimentation with widely varied outcomes. But in the 20th century, one of these materials demonstrated amazing capabilities, titanium. The history of titanium begins in 1791, when both English clergyman William Gregor and German chemist Martin Heinrich Klaproth independently discovered an element with properties unlike any known. Klaproth introduced the name titanium after the titans of Greek mythology. Neither of these scientists were ever able to produce pure titanium from the ore, but instead they made titanium dioxide, which today is a ubiquitous white pigment used in sunscreen. Amazingly, Klaproth and Gregor conducted their investigations without the use of a periodic table, which would not be developed until 1869 by Russian chemist Dmitry Mendeleev. It was only in the early 20th century that titanium metal was finally isolated, first at great expense by New Yorker Matthew Hunter, and later with much greater success by Luxembourger metallurgist William Kroll. The Kroll process is still used to this day in the commercial production of titanium. This strong yet lightweight and chemically inert metal garnered much interest for use in surgery and aerospace engineering. Although they did not always agree, the hard work of both Vesalius and Eustatius greatly advanced the field of anatomy. We trace much of our knowledge of the body's form to them. Meanwhile, 
Radiography allows us to see inside the body, to diagnose afflictions, plan treatments, and monitor the outcome. And infection was a major problem until Lister developed the carbolic acid spray and other antiseptic technologies. And a fortunate accidental discovery led to our current understanding of osseointegration. Bronemark showed us the applicability of titanium as a biomaterial. And of course, where would we be without magnified vision? Leeuwenhoek's invention of the microscope, despite his humble beginnings, reminds us that regardless of your background and origin, a passion for science can take you anywhere. Now that we've walked through some of the events that contribute to dental implant technology of the present, let's take a peek into what the future may hold. You know, there are, I think we're, we're trying to get more towards, um, more towards um, a graph that is certainly living tissue, that's safe, that's biocompatible, um, that's, when I say workable, meaning that you can manipulate and, and has enough flexibility, you can put it into the defect that you want. Not every, you know, defect is going to be like a block. If you get a block of bone, it's going to be the, you know, exactly a block. So there's, there's a lot of criteria by which we measure graphs and by which we choose our graphs. We are headed toward a graph that is beyond safe and biocompatible, advancing the use of living tissue to repair any defect. The applications of regenerative medicine will further enhance the way implants are delivered and ultimately improve the lives of many patients.